the Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Morning, George. It's Tuesday uh, morning. It was a great time. We saw you do the speaker network speaking and then we hung out. So today we have a excellent physician, Dr. Jordan Gitlin. He's a pediatric urologist. And the topic of discussion for today is going to be in our Day in a Life series. So a day in a life of a pediatric urologist. Let's see what it's all about. Take Dr. it away. Dr. Gitlin is a chief pediatric urologist at NYU Langone, Long Island. He's also the managing partner at Pediatric Urology Associates and has published mul- multiple scholarly articles and book chapters. He's been mentored to numerous pediatricians, medical students, urology resident, and urolo- urology fellows in pediatric urology. Dr. Glitton, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you guys. I hope you had a nice time in Long Island. It, it was a lot of fun. It, it was, was like perfect a frat time house to week. It was, it was like been in a frat house for a week. Uh, yeah. We always start by asking you what inspired you to become, in your case, a pediatric urologist. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's one I think about. I actually have one of my oldest daughters in medical school now, and so we talk about what you'll be, and she frequently asks me, how did you decide on pediatric urology? When I was in medical school, I think for all of us when we were in med school, it was a little different. We didn't have access to the internet. We didn't have immediate answers to all the questions we wanted to know. And I think for most of us in medical school, you have to make a decision. Do I want to be in the operating room a good chunk of my day? Do I not want to be in the operating room? And from the minute I started my rotations on surgery, I just loved the technical aspect of surgery and being in the operating room. For a year or so in medical school, I thought I would be a pediatric surgeon. And I loved operating, whatever it was. The one thing back then, this was probably the early, mid-90s or so. It was before a lot of the regulations came about with surgery residents. I just felt that every general surgeon, not pediatric surgeon, but every general surgeon I met was not happy they were. It was so exhausting and so brutal. And I remember speaking with a few of my housemates, probably the end of our third year, I love surgery. I don't think I want to do general surgery. I really don't know what to do. And a friend of mine was on a urology rotation. And she said to me, I think you would love urology. And so I rotated it, did a urology rotation at our school. And then I actually had a relative who lived in Philadelphia. So I went to Philly to do an away elective and had the opportunity to spend two weeks at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And when I met, that was like at that time, that was the mecca for pediatric urology. The giants of pediatric urology there were there. And within the first day of being there, being in the operating room and meeting these men and women, I was like, this is it. This is where I want to be. And that kind of just set me on the course. And I did a urology residency at NYU. And then I went out to Indiana to Riley Children's Hospital to do my fellowship. And that was just an incredible experience. My mentor would say to me every day, he'd look at me, he'd say, you're like a kid in a candy shop. And it was, it was like every day, it was a different case. And we, the unique thing about practicing in the Midwest and a place like Riley is that you really, you take care of every pediatric issue in the entire state and the surrounding states that when I first left New York, I didn't know the surrounding states, but I came to learn them quickly and really loved my time in Indianapolis. What does your typical day look like? Yes, I look at my day. There's so many facets. I mean, I'll comment on the medical part of it, but like George was talking about his barbecuing for his boys and his house being the Center for the, what is it, the oil crew, George? Oil gang. The oil yeah, gang. Yeah. I see so many aspects of my life, father, husband, parent, child to my parents now in, in the generation we're in, and of course, the urologist. And I, and I think for all of us, it's funny, sometimes I come across people who are like, oh, everybody I meet in medicine is miserable, and I can't believe you let your daughter go into medicine. I think what the three of us get to do, uh, and all of us in medicine, is just really... I feel like we're blessed. We're lucky to do what we do, right? We're lucky to 
take care of patients. We're lucky to have intimate conversations with our patients and our families. And, you know, on a day-to-day basis, I, for me, it's totally unique and, and totally different. So I would say for me, my, my days, my typical day, usually I like to talk about wellness. I try to start out with some sort of exercise, right? Keep my, my brain and my body. And then my days are typically split up between either being in the office or being in the operating room. We get students that come into the office, like the student that we have in common, Spencer. Yeah. That boy has to be the most determined person I've ever met in my life. He has a list of things and places and rotations. Everything is urology, 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 which is great if he gets it. Yes. Kids are put through so much. And I think that's where a lot of us senior physicians, where we come around, we say, why would you let your kid go through all this? Mm-hmm. I think the end result of becoming a urologist, a pediatric urologist especially, is a good thing. Yeah. You have to work hard. All, all of us, right? None of us got here. You guys didn't, this podcast didn't come easy. You worked hard for both of you, your residencies. You worked hard for me. I mean, I worked super hard. And I actually continue to work very hard. But I guess the thing I feel lucky about is I really do enjoy it. So I guess for me, the typical day, I see myself as I'm always teaching somebody, right? I'm always teaching and I'm always learning, learning and teaching. And whether that's for students like Spencer, and I'm lucky I have a lot of students that rotate with me, or whether it's my patients who I'm explaining a complex problem with them. And I always say I try to paint with big strokes and take a complex issue and and make it simple, or whether it's, I thought I went into a room and I had a preconceived notion of what the patient needed and been doing this for 20 plus years. And sometimes I'm wrong and I learned something. So I think that's, to me, that's the fun of it. You're always learning, you're always teaching. And that, and that part of, I really made up, but I, I would say a typical day, again, broken up into two, two aspects, right? So there's my clinic days where I'm seeing patients in the office and those days are great, right? Because it's a different, it's a different pace. And I'll see many patients in the office and some patients are very simple. A lot of times it's a parent coming to me, they're concerned. We deal with my child wets the bed and it's what are the things we can do and how can we work that up, reassure them they're going to be okay. And a lot of times that's by doing a good exam and ultrasound, talking them through, letting them know it's a common issue and giving them some simple treatments and going to the complex. And then a lot of the stuff we see is, is surgical, right? We operated on him. This was a 14-year-old boy, insulin-dependent diabetic, whose mom was actually a physician in Egypt. And yeah, brilliant woman, manages his diabetes. Probably she had the, the app, so she's checking his sugars 24-7, monitoring him. And he had come to us with two years of intermittent abdominal pain and vomiting. And someone decided to get an ultrasound during one of these episodes, and it showed very hydronephrotic, blown out kidney consistent with a UPJ obstruction. Wow. And we did a great robotic surgery on him, and that child did well. So that's, that's someone who, you know, from seeing him in the clinic, meeting the family, talking it through, working it up, doing follow-ups of each exam, video visits, getting to know them, diagrams, teaching them, showing them the problem. It's actually getting to fix the problem. In the old days, it would be a big incision. You're in there with your hands. Now it's these tiny little incisions doing this wild robotic surgery. Let me interrupt you for a minute, yeah. right? Because I trained before the Da Vinci robot and only invasive surgery. Everything was a gallbladder surgery. They had this huge thing that you pulled. The medical student's job was to pull the liver back while the <laughs> surgeon took the gallbladder out. Remember those days? Well, so is it, do you go like, through the belly button and blow it up. Is that how you approach with this surgery? Yeah. So we do a fair amount of robotic surgery for things like UPJ obstructions. And we take care of a lot of kids that have like ectopic ureters, or duplicated kidneys that drain into the wrong spot. And so, yeah, so in the past, so you would make a big flank incision and they'd be in the hospital three or four days, could barely move. Every time they took a breath, their intercostal muscles were killing them. Now it's four five to eight millimeter incisions. You start right in the belly button and that's where we get into the peritoneum, put a little trocar in, insufflate the abdomen. And so now they're all blown up and then we roll them on the side so all the bowel drops down. And then we come down and we're we're looking right at the kidney. And the way I describe it is laparoscopic surgery is great. It's these little incisions that lets you work inside. 
But laparoscopic surgery, it's remember the dance, the robot, where you're yeah. moving like this and your arms can move side to side and up and down. That's laparoscopic surgery. What the Da Vinci robot has done is it's taken this movement and now you're, literally your hands inside can move like this. So if you watch the robotic surgeon, it enables us to be able to hold things, to dissect, literally like your hands are. So it's an incredible technology. And to take it down to be able to do it in children is just phenomenal also. And, and we're pushing the limits. And I think the youngest pyeloplasty we've done in a child is about 14 months old. Yeah. Was it bizarre at first? Because when you're, you, you, you went in there, you put your hands in there, you yes. felt how the patient was warm. You were seeing whether oxygenated or not because you were seeing the blood and yes. it was bright red yep. or it was chocolate color. And then you looked at it and it's, you, know, it's, you got a problem. Yeah, was chocolate's it, mad, right? You know, <laughs> you know what the problem is, but <laughs> blood's not supposed to look like chocolate. Was it, did it take some time to get used to losing that feeling and then looking at the screen like you're yeah, playing a video game it's actually a great question right so my our generation of physicians we were all trained you said when everything was open surgery you're right like gallbladder giant incision your job is measure retract retract and so what's interesting is that now most surgical specialists whether it's a general surgeon a urologist OBGYN. 90 plus percent of what they do is robotic. So the men and women training now, they don't really have those open skills. But for someone like me to make that transition was definitely challenging because you're right, like you had that tactile sense. And if you ever got into trouble, if there was red or anything, put your finger on it, gather your thoughts and figure out what was going on. And now it's a whole different skill set. So it definitely took a while. And what's interesting is that the residents they love working with us on pediatrics because still a lot of what we do is open tactile surgery, right? So a lot of the, the groin surgeries, it's a hernia or an orchiopexy or hypospadias surgery, or even some of our bladder surgeries, it's still a lot of it's still open surgery. And they, I see, I'm always reminding them like, hey guys, like this is open, it's different than robotic or it's different than endoscopics. Yeah, it was definitely a big transition. What are your thoughts on the new generation of kids that see surgery or learn surgery as a video game? What happens if that video game breaks and you're not around? Yeah, it's really a problem. And I think that, you know, that our newer colleagues, they do struggle with that. And it's something, luckily, so on one hand, they don't see it that much because thank goodness, robotic surgery and we're getting better and better technically. But it is something, I guess, they do get some open experience. And it's something we really talk about a lot with them and try to prepare them. Like if, yeah, okay, we're doing the, if you were to get into trouble, what would your incision be? And what would your first move be? And try to do the drill in the brain in their mind so they would know what to do. But yeah, it's a potential problem. Yeah, I guess we're Herb, it's almost like back in the day when we used to do paper charts and then you come to the office and there's no senior physician in the office and the internet goes down, the complete machine just stands still because nobody knows how to write. Yeah, but it's time. It's someone yeah, we have time. Someone's got a bleeder you can't control. I know. And you can I, I from when I stopped from surgeons, I, I particularly did not like surgery and I'm I'm a total jerk about it. I just think that surgery for the most part is a failure of medicine. When you can't fix it, you yank it out. But that's very narrow minded. There's lots of things that surgeons fix and you're wonderful people. But what I saw as a medical student was there were some people for me, it was mostly men surgeons who were not very good doctors. They weren't good at the thinking mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. but my God, they were artists. Yeah. And they, they went, they, I had this guy that was just, he, everything was a joke to him. He, he, he was an ob -gen. He will walk in, he would have salsa playing in the operating room. He would do the salsa dance with the nurses as he's getting gown and he's like going like this and like that. He could take a baby out in 10 minutes. And then he go to the next room, still dancing, change <laughs> over, take another baby out in the 10 minutes. He never had a bad outcome. But he was just, he, it was like watching a guitar player or this phenomenally gifted artist with his hands. And it was just nothing to him. It was just like a basketball player that he just does it. He's not even thinking about what he's doing. 
Yeah. And I saw him say, I thought the woman was going to die. I was a C-section. She didn't want to come in because of the holidays. So she stayed in labor at home for 24 yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. When he opened that uterus, it was so thin that mm -hmm. every time he put a stitch to close it up, it would be hiss and the whole thing would start bleeding. Wow. And it was wow. a young 20. So I'm like, yeah. this woman's going to die. I don't wow. know why she was an intern. A woman died in the oh, right. from childbirth. And he pulled it. I don't know how he pulled it out. It was like a, show, a sewing machine. Didn't work. To his, do it again until he stopped the bleeding. Yeah. He was yeah. amazing. The woman OB Jen had trained in the US and she had a fellowship in fallopian tube surgery. Mm -hmm. No one wanted to operate with. Three mm. C sections, 45 minutes. Yeah. She was the most delicate attention to every detail. Mm -hmm person in the world phenomenal mm -hmm. but she couldn't she, she just couldn't pivot right. everything had to be done because her expertise with fallopian tubes she had to do a c-section this was like no it's got to be done dab stitch dab stitch right. no that's not what we need we need the baby out and we need to get the mom right. off the table as fast as we can so i can't imagine people who don't have that skill set in an that's emergency having the skill of that one surgeon that had done it so many times he didn't think about it he wasn't courteous about it yeah. but his hands were just magic yeah those guys that have been doing it for so long that's where you got the god complex in surgeons right. because i remember there used to be a surge a general surgeon out here one of the very few pediatric surgeons back in the day i won't mention mm -hmm. his name was the best surgeon. He would operate on anything. He would never be afraid. His bedside manner was the worst. We used to we would call him in for an appendicitis before it was robotic and CAT scans and everything. He was his diagnoses were on the money each and every time. He says, look, if you want to get your kid better, he's the surgeon for you. Get over it. But that's not appropriate anymore these days. You really need to find a balance. People, when they meet you, they want to like you. It's a whole combination. And I always say to the residents when they work with us, I say, you got here, you got to residency because you could take a test. You got into med school because you could take a test. When you got from med school to residency, you wrote a paper, you did a test. But now, whether it's pediatric, whether it's pediatrology, now you have to learn a trade. You have to learn the skill. And that part of that skill is how to talk to people, how to make them feel good, how to recognize when a patient comes to you, right? A kid with a fever, you have to recognize immediately. Is that something that's, this kid's really sick and it's going to crap out and needs to go to the hospital? Or is it Tylenol Motrin and you're going to be fine? And it's the same, it's that trade that you just, you can't, you don't learn it in a book, right? That's why we have to spend years and years doing it, being able to make those decisions. Yeah, I have a very funny uh, story about that because my nephew had two trigger thumbs. And I sent him to the pediatric orthopedic surgeon, who's phenomenal in, at, at a children's in Fairfax, Michael Ring. And Michael Ring is a typical orthopedic surgeon. I talked to him before I sent my nephew. He goes, sounds like it, Herb. You know, we'll get operated. Said, yeah, my sister's married to a radiologist. I'm sending them over. They're going to see you. This is great. Thank you. See you. Boom. Phone hangs up. He goes in and he walks in. He goes, oh, you're Herb's sister. Yes. Yeah, your kid's got a trigger thumb. My assistant will schedule you for the OR. Great to meet you. Say hi to Herb. Walk the motion. So he called me crying, right? This is a bad human being. How could you spend me? Oh, wait, I think you're married to a radiologist. He makes plenty of money. Yes. And you're Catholic. You're not looking to get divorced. She said, no. I said, I didn't send you on a date. I sent you on right. someone will cut the right. kid open, fix it, and the thumb won't fall off and he won't get an infection. That's all you care about. Right. Whether he's nice, blonde, tall, short, Jewish, Catholic, Muslim, you don't care. Right. You just right. care about a good outcome. So get over it. With patient satisfaction. No. Nope. Right. Right. Sure. Yeah. And I have a bunch of questions for you because everything changes so fast. Yeah. The undescended rectile penis, uh, penis uh, testicle drives me nuts. Yes. Yeah. We, we see a ton of kids, right? Yes. Typical day, right? So typical day that when I'm in the clinic, I'm seeing kids with everything. That's a, a big thing I see, right? So. I always say that you guys as pediatricians are at a disadvantage because when they, these boys come to you, let's say four or five-year-old kid, they're nervous, they're tense. 
you guys have to check everything, right? So you start the head, the ears, the nose, the throat, chest, belly. By the time you guys get down to the genital region, they're already tense, right? By the time you get down to the genital region, they're tense, their cremaster reflexes have kicked in, and a lot of times the testicles have retracted up into the groin. And then when you're examining them, they're even more tense. It's hard to bring them down. And so a lot of times those kids end up in my office. Sometimes they've had an ultrasound. And during the ultrasound also, the boys get tense. The testicles move up to the groin. And so when I see one of these kids who's coming to me, typically a little bit older, and now the pediatrician can't find it, typically what I'll do is, first thing I do is have the parent give the child their phone. Right? I said to the kid, this is the one time I'm going to tell you, stay on the phone. Everyone's telling you to get off the phone. I'm going to tell you, stay on your phone. So have the kid lay down, go on the phone, totally distracts them. And then I always say, for me, I go right for where the action is, right? With the parents there, of course, we examine them. And most of the time, once they relax, if it's truly a retractile testicle, we can bring it down. And for me, the key is, can I get it to come down? Is it loose and not on any tension? And as long as there's no pain, no tension. I have the parent look. I say, look, here's the testicle. I show them if you tickle the leg, how it moves up and down. And then I reassure them that 90% of kids, they're going to be fine over time with puberty. The testicle gets bigger, it gets heavier, and the 90% of kids aren't going to need anything. But there are those kids that, let's say you've seen at two, three, and four, and now they're six or seven, and all of a sudden the testicle's not down anymore. And I think that's a group of boys where when they're little, the shorter the testicle reaches nicely. Then as their body grow and they get taller and taller, all of a sudden we realize that cord that was fine and adequate to get the testicle into the scrotum when they were three and four is no longer long enough where the, the muscles around the cord are too tight at six and seven because of the change in linear growth. And those are the kids that sometimes end up needing a little surgery to bring it down. So we're always, because a lot of times they come in, pediatrician you know, told me it was there. Now it's not there. And so a lot of times that's the reason I explain to them. Like, yeah, things, the exam can change over time. And so sometimes we do have to intervene and bring it down. And for me, I always give them the, op I always talk about, always my recommendation is surgery. I always mention things like HCG, which I, I never do, but I know parents are going to read about it. And so I like to hit it off before they start questioning, oh, could we do hormonal therapy? I'm not a big fan of it. Um, in Europe, they do it a little more. And in the past, when people have tried it, it makes the exam a little bit better. And then you're trying to convince yourself that it worked. And then once it wears off, you're right back where you started. But when do you refer to them then? Because I don't want to be sending kids to the pediatrologist they, and the testicle comes down and they go, I didn't go home. I think if you have a child, maybe bring them back just to recheck the testicles, not do a full exam. Do those tricks that I said, have them relax, go on the phone, try to you know, not be tense. And I think if you've checked them and it's really hard to get that, I think they should be referred. Here's the problem, Herb, that if a kid, those kids that have had retractile testicles that have now moved up, let's say that kid doesn't come to us and now he's 10, and now he's 12, and now he's 13, and now he's in puberty and the testicle's really not down. The problem is that if we move that down once he's in puberty, those testicles really don't function to make much sperm. They make hormones, but the sperm producing capability, once that testicle has been in the groin and puberty, it's going to be an issue. And the risk of testicular cancer? If it's a retract testicle, probably no greater than the normal child. It's really the testicles that have been undescended at birth. Those are the ones that are at risk of slightly increased risk of testicular cancer. And there's good data to show that if you bring those testicles down by about two years of age, that risk really goes down even lower. So retractile testicle, no issues with fertility, no is as long as they're down at puberty, no issues with cancer. Undescended testicle, one undescended testicle, no issue with fertility. And as long as you bring it down, I'll say by two, really the, the risk of a tumor is not zero, but really goes down quite low. And so you really, the, the ultrasound is useless. It's better to just go ahead and have the PT urologist take a look and reassure yeah. everybody that it's okay. It's interesting. So in our guidelines, we really don't talk about using ultrasound. But with that said, I do like to use ultrasound in some instances. I think if it's a, right, so if you have a kid who has a retractile test, and a lot of times the ultrasound parents want, so that sometimes we're driven, pushed to do things by the parents, whether that's right or wrong. So I'm okay with that. 
But the truth of the matter is that, yeah, if it's truly a retractile testicle, when they go for the ultrasound, they're going to be tense. It's going to move up into the groin and the ultrasonographers just, they're not examined. They're just putting a probe and say, what's in the groin? And so that's why a lot of times we'll reassure them. So I would say, yeah, probably better just send them to us. So I have a funny story because you said sometimes you just have to do something. I, I'm so blessed. I get to stay with George and Deli is also a pediat- pediatrician at their house, right? And so Deli says, could you go in the garage, in the freezer? I just bought these things we're going to use for the barbecue. They're in the freezer and I'm having a panic attack. Man can't find anything. And now I'm a guest and I got to find something in somebody's freezer. So I'm there over the phone looking, the flashlight looking and looking. I can't find it. I'm like, I moved everything around. I took all the Omaha steaks out and put them back in. I couldn't find this thing she wanted, some cheese puffs or something. She comes and I'm like, oh my God, you don't open that thing. You say, here it is. And she looked, looked everywhere. She says, I thought I put them here. I really went through all the motions because it was what it was going to take to m- make sure Delia was happy with my work. Right. And sometimes that's what you do for parents. A CBC isn't going to do much. It isn't going to be much information. But it's not very, it's a very low key interventions and expensive, mm-hmm. good safety profile. I'll get the CBC, tell them mom the CBC is great. It looks fine. Correct. The right. discussion's over. And yeah, so sometimes you order an ultrasound just to make sure everybody's happy and then you move on. From the perspective of, a pediatrician in a children's hospital, everybody with a UTI has reflux and they're going to end up in dialysis because you rotate with a pediatric urologist. And in the old days, they would put the films up on the wall and it was one grade reflux is this, three or four. I'm teasing you. I, I did in Costa no. Rica, there was a clinic with a pizza nephrologist. Yeah. That was only reflux. Yeah. And it was a whole day clinic and every yeah. patient that you saw had reflux. And it was one film after the so, other. Boom, boom. What grade is it? Because you know, depending on the grade, we're going to have to send, get the urologist yeah. involved. Blah, blah, blah. What is it? What, how do we think about it today when that's not what really happens in the real world? That happens right. when you're at, at the very Mecca. So I actually do... You were talking Costa Rica. I think you mentioned. I actually do it every year. I go down to uh, Guatemala with the uh, with a few of the guys who I trained with in Indiana, and you described it to a T. We work with a pediatric nephrologist, and we show up there, and we do a clinic on Sunday, and probably thirty of those patients. This kid has reflux. This kid has reflux, and you got to fix it. 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 And so it's very interesting the way we treat those kids than how we treat the kids in the States, right? And for a few different reasons, there's no doubt that in a country like Guatemala, where I go, the combination of reflux and boys who are not circumcised, right? Increased risk of infection, right? Those kids are at a much, much greater risk. But here in the States, we've totally changed our approach. And and I think for the better, right? So when I was a fellow, we probably did six to eight ureter reimplants a week, every week. Right now, maybe I do one ureteral reimplant a month, one every other month for several reasons, right? First of all, we're not screening every single child with a UTI with a VCUG. It got, I've, I've worked with people that even people with non-febrile UTIs were getting these synergies, which is ridiculous because most of those kids, it's just avoiding issue, constipation, things like that. Our, our paradigm has really shifted for a few reasons. I think the first AAP recommendation several years ago basically said, with one UTI, you don't need to do a VCUG on, on all those kids. And there's a lot of pushback from urologists, but I fall in the camp where I agree with pediatricians. That's how I practice. I don't really rush to get a VCUG in every child with one febrile UTI. The other thing is that we've seen that the rates of scarring, there's a big study called the River Trial, where they randomized kids to antibiotics and no antibiotics, even kids that had reflux. And the rates of UTIs were definitely a bit low when you're on antibiotics, but I'm not sure that it was so huge that it justifies putting everybody antibio- on antibiotics. And if you're not going to put everybody on antibiotics, do you need to be as aggressive and be screening for it and over-treating all these kids? We were also doing VCUGs and everybody that had two millimeters of in utero hydronephrosis. 
we were just getting, it was one of the most common tests we were ordering. So I would say our, our paradigm has really changed to more education, talking to parents. If I see a kid who's had one febrile UTI, I will do an ultrasound because I think that Hewitt said, Herb, it's a very low risk exam. It gives me a, a good window into the inside, how the kid needs to look. I can reassure the parents, the kid needs to look okay. And then if I see an abnormality, or if I have a child who, let's say, was in the ICU from a febrile UTI and was like very septic, that's a kid I might be aggressive with. If I have a kid that's got multiple medical problems, cardiac problems, other issues that can't really afford another infection, those kids I might be a little more aggressive. But for a healthy eight-month-old that has one febrile UTI and a normal ultrasound, I'll probably hold off on doing a VCUG to see if the child develops another infection. And then if they do and they have reflux, then it's a much easier discussion, I think, with the parents to say, okay, hey, now you've had two infections. Let's look at this VCUG. I throw up the films. I ask them what grade it is. No, I'm kidding. I, I meant them. We'll, we'll look at the films together. We'll go over the grading. And then we'll talk about the benefits of that. There are some benefits to being on antibiotics for a while. And then it's always a decision. And then what? Because in the penance protocol was, if you came to me at six months and had a febrile UTI, you went on antibiotics, you got checked every few months with an ultrasound, then you got a VCUG every year. Then if it didn't go away, we would talk about a reimplant. And so now we're me at least, I really try to pull back and I'll put a child on antibiotics for a while. And then if they've done fire, some of these kids will give them a trial off of antibiotics, depending on what the grade of the reflux was. We'll see how they do. Some parents on their own, they'll come back. I'll say, oh, how's, how's Susie doing? She's taking her antibiotic. We stopped the antibiotics six months ago. She's been fine. Went great. Mom knows best. And sometimes they do. Yeah. Right? I so, go I mean, back, I'll go back to the first lesson in pediatric medicine that I learned from my senior probably before your time when we had Bob Brown at RBK Pediatric, mm -hmm. told me pediatric medicine can be summed up as children in general will get better despite what we do to them. Sometimes if you give them a therapy or you provide something, you might make them feel better. You might shorten the duration of the illness for a period of time, make them feel better, maybe make the parents feel better. But the true art of pediatric medicine is in the room of 100 to see the one that's abnormal. Absolutely. Right? But I think that talent is being lost. I don't know how mm -hmm. many can do that. Can you walk in a room and smell a problem? Or he can, but it's what we were talking about. Yeah. Once you only do the Da Vinci robotic surgery and that fails and you are not, you haven't done a bunch of open surgery, you're not going to learn it in that minute of, of, of pandemonium. Yeah. And these younger pediatricians also haven't seen meningitis or ha haven't seen vocal cellulitis, haven't seen many septic kids, but mm -hmm. severe pneumonias. And I don't think they know what to do when they actually see somebody that is in real trouble. How about the SMA scans for the kids who have ILOs or the use of procalcitonin as a marker to guide your referral pattern or your own? Yeah. Which no, it's, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great question. So I don't really use procalcitonin that much at all, to be honest, but I do use DMSA scans a fair bit. DMSA scan is a, it's an injectable agent that will assess for renal scarring. And so many times when I have a child, let's say who's had higher grades of reflux and we're at that inflection point where they've been on antibiotics for a while and we want to know, hey, has this reflux been damaging to the kidneys or not? Do I need to do anything about it? That is for me where I'll use the DMSA scan because the discussion becomes a lot different if I do a DMSA scan, it's totally normal. If I have a normal DMSA scan, normal ultrasound, I say to the parents, hey, we've been on antibiotics for a while, no damage to the kidneys, everything looks good, it's probably fine. Versus the child who, let's say, comes back and the kidney that looked okay on ultrasound, maybe it was a little bit smaller, has less function and we see scarring throughout the kidney and maybe that kid has had repeated infection. So I really like it. I think it's a very powerful tool to help with the management of these kids. There, People talk about what's called the top down and the bottom up approach with dealing with reflux, right? Bottom up meaning do VCUG, see if there is reflux. 
top down, see if there is pyelonephritis, and then use that to guide your your knee or not for VCUG. I use it more as I'm having the discussion with the families, really trying to figure out what's the thing to do for their child. For me, very powerful tool. Problem mm. is hard to get the agent. There was a shortage of the agent for a while, so we couldn't even get the agent, but now it seems to be okay with it. Yeah, and it's much more cumbersome. You got to get an IV and into younger trials, there's got to be a, a radiology group that does a lot of children as a nurse. Uh, Correct. All, all that complicates the testing, the process. And then you must do a bunch of circumcision and only one Cir- hunter. And I agree on this. I, and I thought I was the only one crazy enough to say this in an exam room. It's always the mother or the grandmother's concern. And I look at them straight in the eye and I go, did you choose a partner based on what their penis look? They go, of course not. I said, no one does. Maybe he's good looking. You thought he could provide your children with a nice house and he would be a good father. He's someone who's happy, you, you're happy to hang around with on the weekend. What was below the belt was just inconsequential. You'd already made the decision you wanted to marry this man. But right. I assure you, your son's trajectory will be the same and you're the only one that pays any attention to it. Because if some other guy looks at his weed too too much, he's going to get clocked in the nose. Yes. And they're like, oh, okay. All right. And I said, so we're done with the conversation. Next, right? Um, how many circumcisions do you have to do a week? So it's a great debate to circumcise or not circumcise, right? And I think the most recent AAP guidelines have said that the, the benefits of circumcision, if a family wants it, are justified, right? I think two different two issues are circumcision, the newborn or the older child, and then the revision circumcisions. For me, I feel it's a parent's thing. Somebody wants to be circumcised, that's their decision. And we make ourselves available to provide that service. We see a lot of kids, a lot of OBs don't want to do circumcision in the, in the hospital anymore. We see a lot of OBs that if there's if the what's called the median raffe, which is the line that runs up the bottom of the penis, if that's off to the side, they tell the parents it's something horribly abnormal that can't be circumcised, or there's hydrocels, they're afraid to circumcise, or webbing, they're afraid to circumcise. So we we get a ton of newborn patients coming to us who want to be circumcised, and we do a lot of them in the if the parents want. And I put it: if this is something you want, your decision. I'm, I'm happy to do it. So we do a ton of newborn circumcisions mm. in the office. Yeah. Within the office. It, in Michigan, the pediatricians did the circumcision in the nursery and here in, at Prince William Hospital too, the bell, the clamp, and yeah, I don't know what they, I was doing. It's, it's, I think it's, I, I can regret that I've done. But I, I put the lidocaine right. and everything, but I still, right. it's still, but when the ones I was mentioning is the ones that they were circumcised and the mom's oh, like, yeah. I think the foreskin's a little too big. I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah. So those, so my typical, my typical discussion with those parents are, look, if you leave it alone, he's going to be fine. Some of those kids, if there are some kids that were circumcised that develop like a secondary phimosis or that really have persistent problems. Typically I'll start them. I use a ton of Kenalog in my practice, right? It's topical, steroidal. I always tell parents like hydrocortisone. It's very benign. I'm going to say 90% of the time, it resolves any irritation. If there are little adhesions, it resolves it. And then they're fine. We convince them it looks fine and, and they move on. There are some kids that driven by the parents, they, they want them recircumcised or it wasn't adequate or the kid's really having lots of infections or they develop skin bridges or it's constant irritation. And so those will do. But I always put it out to the parents. So this is not something he needs. You can leave it alone, it'll be fine. Do a little topical therapy. If it's really a problem and you're really driven, we, we could revise it. Yeah. In the office, I've seen a lot of children that had balanitis, phimos, mm-hmm. irritation, grit. Mm-hmm. They, they, they seem to have these problems, and those are the kids that we send over. It's not like it doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. No, look, I, circum- I did a circumcision on a boy two Fridays ago. I was actually at Good Sam. And I'd seen him in the office. This was a kid who originally presented to us with difficulty urinating. I've never circumcised. And probably about one to two percent of all non-circumcised boys develop this horrible inflammatory reaction 
at the tip of the foreskin where it basically closes down. And so he was peeing, and I'm saying gotas, which are drops. He was peeing like little drops. And when we actually did his circumcision, it was so inflamed. And that inf- inflammatory process, it's like lichen sclerosis of the penis. It actually spreads onto the glands of the head of the penis and can actually affect the meatus. So there are some kids like, they really get into trouble. And, and those are the kids that, that you really, unfortunately, they just need something done because it can really affect affects the urethra, the meatus. It really can be a problem. Luckily, most kids don't. Like you guys said, if you leave them alone, they're going to be fine. So what? So I asked you the questions from the perspective of a pediatrician. That's what interests me in pediatric urology because you see it all the time. Yeah. What is from the pediatric urologist side that we don't send enough to you that we can make a difference? That's part of what you see a lot in your clinics. Yeah. Yeah. You asked, I'll just pivot back to the typical day, right? So the typical day. In addition to whether I'm in the clinic, whether I'm in the operating room. So in our clinic, we see, a, we work with several nurse practitioners and PAs that work with us. And we see a lot of kids with voiding dysfunction and bedwetting, right? And I think that that's something we love seeing. And there's, before I join you guys, I'm actually listening to a lecture talking about the neurophysiology and neuropathology of voiding. Because we see a ton of kids, a ton of kids that have really what we call dysfunctional voiding, voiding issues. And I think that sometimes, and I think a lot of pediatricians around here send them, but I think a lot of times there's probably a push if they're bedwet or if they're having little accents of, oh, it's just they're going to outgrow it, they're going to outgrow it, they're going to be fine. And I think when we get those kids, really can provide a very good service to them because a lot of times in those kids, it's something simple like very aggressive bowel management, right? Like constipation. It's right, I'm sure from your guys' perspective, number one cause of abdominal pain, probably constipation, right? Yeah. From our standpoint, number one cause of voiding issues is constipation. But if we're not aggressive enough in treating it and really pushing the limits, the kids are going to continue to have their voiding issues. And we do a lot of stuff working with our nurse practitioners and people. We really get aggressive with these kids with pelvic floor exercises reteaching them. We do something called biofeedback, which kind of reteaches them how to relax their external sphincters and how to pee in a more coordinated fashion. We do a lot of work with watches to remind the kids to pee, alarms at night for bedwetting. And then we do a lot of aggressive work with medical therapy. And there's, in the past, when a kid came to the old-time pediatric urologist, kid comes who's having trouble urinating, you put them on ditropan or oxybutynin, and that's what it was. It turns out that there's a whole host of medications that we use. And I actually run a conference once a month where probably 50 people from around the country, even some far other countries, we meet to talk about complex kids with voiding issues. And it always, almost always circles back to kids with anxiety, kids with ADD, kids with other issues, tick disorders, things like that that can manifest themselves with voiding. And so to me, that's one of the most interesting things that we take care of because it's so complicated and it just ties into the whole neuropsych, neurophysiology aspect of treatment. Yeah, I have a patient in the clinic that, I don't know, it's a, she's a girl, I don't know, she goes, I never remember how old people are, but her brother has spina bifida. Spina, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's, he's in a wheelchair and he's all laddered. And she sits in the toilet and it takes 10 minutes for her to be. And of course, the mother's out of her mind, like, maybe we need an MRI of her spine mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. all of this. And I'm like, maybe she's just stressed. Right. Well, you're right. You're right. She, so it's fascinating. So when you're stressed, right, think about what, and, and this is why I love dealing with it. Because all kids that come in, everybody's stressed, right? everybody's anxious, everyone's stressed. But in a kid like that, who's very stressed, I always say, think about what happens if you had to go speak in front of a thousand people and you're nervous, right? You're, you release a lot of adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine. What happens to your heart rate? It goes up, right? So that's a physiologic response to stress in your brain. When you're in a constant state of stress, your circulating epinephrine, norepinephrine is higher and our bladder necks are, that's where alpha receptors, alpha receptors are. And so when you have a high sympathetic tone, it goes to the bladder neck 
and it causes it to tighten up. And so a lot of times that's why a lot of these kids, maybe you're a patient, it's, they sit in the toilet for a while because they can't get the bladder neck to relax. So that's where drugs like Slomax, for example, which we use for older men with prostate problems, does nothing to the prostate, but it's an alpha one or it's an alpha blocker. And it works great in kids like that because it helps to relax the bladder neck and the external sphincter. And oh, so wow. that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's very cool stuff, right? It all ties in. Yeah. We, we have another, I'll just tell you a quick snippet. We have another patient we just took care of, a crazy case. He's got, he's got a lot of issues. But one of his issues, his spasticity and his tone is so high. And what happens is that he can't relax his bladder neck to when he has to urinate. We've done urodynamics. And so what happens is he, he pushes so hard that he, for years, we finally got him. He actually has rectal prolapse. Pushes so hard that he has rectal, I mean, I'm talking like significant rectal prolapse. Oh, gosh. So we tried him on Flowmax. There's a, another drug called Rapid Flow, a little more specific. We tried it, nothing worked, nothing worked. And the rectal prolapse was pretty bad. So he saw a pediatric surgeon who said, like, I think I have to do something to rectal prolapse. I said, yeah, when you do that, I'm going to come in at the same time, breathe him out. We Botox, put Botox into his external sphincter. Wow. And so it, it basically just causes it to open up. And the hope is that now his rectal prolapse is fixed. And hopefully when he pees, he'll, his sphincter will be a little bit more relaxed. He'll still be continent because his bladder neck will work, but he hopefully won't have to push. He's had scopes, there's no blockage, there's no stricture. It's just this physiologic, neuropsychiatric, physiologic thing. Fascinating. Yeah, and then you gave me PTSD, right? You you violated the commandments of the surgeons. You never operate with another surgeon because then you get the patients. No, nowadays now we're much more collaborative. No, we do. I this one PDS, we do cloaca repairs together. We do a lot of stuff together because the parents always ask when they're in there putting the tubes for the kid. Could they fix this belly button hernia? Oh, like yeah. you're gonna get two surgeons to operate the same patient at the same time. That's just like you know, I'm, it's a lot of work, Rob. It's a lot of work, but I'll tell you that we do make it work. We find a way to make it work. Funny. And that's actually, to me, I, and I'm sure you guys feel the same, right? That's the fun of, not only do we get to be doctors, but we get to be pediatric doctors. And to me, it's always a different level. And I see it, I see, and I'm sure your offices are the same, right? Everybody that comes in, it's all about taking care of kids. And I see the way my staff are with kids. It's just, a, just such a great level. And, and I really see it with our patients you know, I'm sure you guys deal with this, right? Your patients have special needs and now they're 18 and they're 19 and they're 20 and they're 21. What do you do with these patients? Because they're used to coming to see you and your staff are so oriented towards the parents and the kids. I'll tell you what we do. We continue to see them. And I have patients that take care of special needs whose parents are still their primary caregiver and they're in their thirties. I, I just, I can't turn them over to anybody. I don't, I, what do you guys do for those patients? Do they well, have adults? You- you don't have any to turn them over too. That's the problem. They don't want to mess around with. It's too complicated. Right. And yeah, we see them up right. until 26. I, I have a problem turning over because we do a lot of ADHD evaluations to management. I cannot get a 26-year-old to go to internal medicine. No. To get their Ritalin. They will not do it. Yeah, they can come in one month. We can make a chart and give them one month prescription. But they're not going to send them to their neurologist for the meds. Yeah. They will not see them. You, you have a, an advantage that you trained as a general urologist first. Correct. For you, it's not such a breach to keep seeing the kid when they're That's 30 or 35 because you have that background. For us, at least for me, I struggle because as you've mentioned several times, there's a certainly a great degree of art to medicine. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of learning that happens from, I call titrating, not failure, but titrating. Mm-hmm. I like so, that. Yeah. So, for example, I know how to treat high cholesterol. Right. What do you do? You put them um, on Lipitor or that's, that's what you do. And I know even the dose of Lipitor is 10 milligrams. But what I don't know, because I don't do it for every day, is that, right. for example, Crestor is much more effective and it causes a lot less muscle cramping. Right. Right. And it's better tolerated by the patient. Right. I don't know that because I I don't have a thousand patients in Lipitor that I switched right. over to breast. Right. And so right. I feel like I am not giving the patient 
the advantage of that experience that someone else has because they're seeing adults every day. Good point. Yeah. I still get myself over my head because I try to help. And I always say that, yeah, I can manage your cholesterol, but am I the best person for that? Probably not. Yeah. Because I don't have that feedback look of this medication works better with that patient and this one causes a lot of leg cramping and this one causes a lot of GI upset because I don't do it every day. Mm-hmm. So important. I'm I'm curious to what else what other good stories you have from your visit to Guatemala and Bolivia. Oh my god, it's just the the one thing I would say it, it always have every year when we go down there. So it's you know, mission trips. They all they're amazing. I feel they're always the same, right? You get down there, it's incredible. Then we do a clinic. We see probably a hundred plus kids. What I always amazes me is that patient number one is seen at seven a.m. Patient number a hundred is seen at. 7 p.m. and nobody complains. Oh yeah, nobody complains, right? They're not a complaint. And and people are coming and going. We might run out to get a snack because we're like drained from it. Nobody complains. Thank you. But probably one of the wildest things we see when we go down there is there's a condition. It's called bladder extrophy, and it's where the bladder kids are born with the bladders outside their body, and invariably it it really doesn't affect your health. It just you, you reek onto your skin. And invariably, every year we go down there, kids up who's traveled 14 hours from somewhere deep in, in rural Guatemala and comes in with like towels just tied around them and here to be fixed. And it's always amazing to me, I guess, the patience that people have, the distances they travel, the appreciation, and then the, the things that we see and, and that we're able to help them with. And I, I guess, the, and, and the biggest thing we, we've changed over the years, we've been going probably 17 years now. And we've really, by going the same place every year, we have such a great relationship with the nephrologists, the pediatric surgeons, urologists down there, and through technology, right? Emails and web, WebEx and media, that like the care is so much better, right? Like they have a question, they text me, hey, this kid's here, what do I do with this tube? Let me send you a picture of this. Here's what's going on. And really, the, the change has been awesome. And then when you're down there, do you have a Da Vinci robot? Or, or do you, no, so, so you, you get to practice the, the open surgery techniques. Oh, yeah. This, I, I took my daughter with me. I took my daughter's a first-year med student. Last May, we went down there. And the first case we did, first case was an 11-year-old boy. He had bilateral UPJ obstructions. Okay, so bilateral UPJ obstructions have been managed for a year with tubes hanging out his back. Okay, that's what was managed for a year. Infection. So the approach was literally two subcostal incisions, two giant incisions. So the first case, we're like, said to my daughter, scrub with us. I did it with one of the pediatric surgeons. We're like, put your hand in here, hands on the liver. She's holding the bowel. And it was great. Well, yeah, oh, back yeah. home, this would be teeny tinies. It doesn't exist there, but the kid got a great operation. Tubes came out and bigger scar, a little bit longer recovery. But in the end, the result was fantastic. I'm curious, is she going to go into urology or she doesn't know yet? So, great question. I wish she would go into pediatric urology, but you know what she wants to do? Pediatric surgery. Yeah, close enough. She's really well, close she's enough. A, yeah, it's cool. And, and I, I said to you, here's what I'd love. You'll become a pediatric surgeon in about 15 years. I'll know when my time has come and I'll come in and I'll be your first assistant. Right? How great would that be? I'll just stand there. I'll hold the camera for you. I'll retract for you. I'll be the best first assistant you ever had. Yeah, that's so give you some advice with her. Because my yeah. son is a third year medical student. Oh, nice. And everybody said, oh, you should go into pediatrics. You, should, you want to do surgery. You want to do ortho. You want to do everything but pediatric. He rotated in our office and he saw, we don't just do well baby checks and right. murmurs. We do like real medicine. Yeah. He's going into pediatric. I love and, it. and his girlfriend. I love it. I love it. Peds. Pediatrics is a great thing. It, we see everything, but you have to yeah. want to see it. You have to be accessible. Right. Yeah. And, and but, but you guys also, like you said, you practice, right? You don't. You're not sending every kid. You're managing these kids. You're working them. You're like, you're the place parents feel like I'm here. Yeah. Figure out what's wrong. Right. Go, they got a cough. Go to the E. You're 
doing all that stuff there and treating them and taking care of them. It's a difference. Yeah, that culture, that practice was established way back in 1958 by Dr. Reichman in his garage. Yeah. It's amazing. He always told us you have to have access to care. You have to care about the patient, fix their problem. And if they need to go somewhere, send them somewhere. And don't just give them a piece of paper, go to the urologist. Call the urologist, call the specialist, run the case by them. More of a, a relationship kind of a thing, not just here, push a button and go. And look, George, that's what patients want, right? Like I always say yeah. to my, I always, I, I think it of myself. I say to my colleagues and my staff, I'm like, patients want an experience. They don't want to just, they want to know what's going on, but they want to feel taken care of. They want to know they can come to you. They want to know you're available, you're accessible, right? That's the key, right? Yeah, I, I, I was taught by Dr. Reichman that like we, we get these kids that have leukemia or more devastating mm. problems. So mm. they end up going to a lot of our hematology. Kimon goes over to you guys with Dr. Samek, mm. that crew. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't manage it anymore. They go somewhere else, Northwell or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't get involved, but we always call and check in. How are you doing? What's going on? Yeah. And they appreciate that. But, but it's, like, not, it's not only the relationship with the kids and the parents. It's, and this is missing and this is Epic's fault. I, I, I used to know adult pulmonary guys, the cardiologists, the pediatric cardiologists, the pediatric pulmonary guy, the GI, the surgeons. And you said, it, George, if it's a call, this kid's got this, this is what I've done. I'm going to send you the records over. They're going to call your office for an appointment. And then you would shoot the breeze. How's your daughter? What, what year is she in? Is she going to do a rotation with us? And, and that's sorely missing. And I think that's part of why physicians are not happy and they want to leave. There's no there, that, I'll tell you, that's why every time I give a talk to a group of pediatricians, or if I, we have to have some of these patient reps that go out to meet pediatricians and talk about, I always say, give my cell number. What, what do they give it? I put it up. If they give a talk, put it up. Because pe people, think, it's so easy. George, if you're seeing a kid and you have a cry, shoot me a text. Send me a picture of it. Is this a concern? Not a concern. And it's, it takes the stress off of you. Parents feel relieved. And I feel they're like, spoke, two seconds, done. It's either something we got to deal with or not. And it just really, I think, helps with the care. Yeah, I agree. The epic, it takes it, makes it a little colder. But the cell phone, I get texts all day long. I love it. The best. Yeah, I do the, it used to be you call them up, talk to the secretary, they come, they interrupt you, you get on the phone, I ask you your question. That takes time and it interrupts yes. you. I have a bunch of specialists on my cell phone. I say, hey, can you, I send a text, can you give me a call? I have a question. Because I don't know if you're in the operating room or you're in a console, right. something or, and then they'll call back. They always call back. Hey, what's going on? What can I do? Yeah. Convenience. Then I'll yeah. patient back with the answer later. Yeah, that's what that's patients want. That's why I give patients. My, I actually believe in not give patients my email address, not my Gmail, but like my I have a work email. And people are like, oh my God, you must get a million emails. No, people are super respect. It's like they know it. They know they have you if they need you. And there's the email I respond. It's really never a big deal. It will never, like when I'm on call, I'll call back from my cell phone, but I don't use this block in technique of yeah. or covering on my phone. I've had one patient my entire yep. career call me directly. Yep. And then I said, listen, this is my personal cell phone. Please call the office and they'll get yeah. me. They'll, they never did it again after that. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody ever does that. They don't, most patients are respectful of us. Totally yeah. respectful. I agree. And so I had an interesting question. You, you've talked several times today, WebEx, texting, email, all tools to better communicate with other physicians and maybe even your patients, mm -hmm. but you avoid social media. So it's funny. So I, so funny because in my family, they, they have a joke, we, a joke with them because they're all on Instagram and TikTok. I'm like, guys, I do no social media. And, and they always make fun of, them, oh, you're so special. I'm so busy during the day. I'm, whether it's emailing people or texting people or working or communicating, and whenever I go and I get sucked into like Instagram, I just feel like my brain goes numb and I just, I'm looking through things I don't really care about. And so for me, yeah, I, I, I don't, it's, it's so funny you ask that, Herb, because I really, I don't do any social, I don't know, I don't know that there's, I have capacity in my, I don't have the wavelength to, to do it. 
Well, after this podcast, I promise you, you're going to be all over social media. Okay. Especially on LinkedIn. Fair enough. Yeah. I know. I probably should, right? I probably need to, to step up my game. I know. Right? I, no. I, yeah, Spencer no. will show you. Spencer will show I, you. Close. I, I, the only reason I think that social media is important, and I would do for what I do, Instagram is important because who has children? It's mm-hmm. young women. And yeah. young women are particularly pulled into Instagram for whatever yeah. reason. But it does build community. So your experience is how many thousands of kids you're seeing that you're you yeah. know, taking care of. Sure. Uh, that community would always be there to celebrate wins. And I think that's where it can be impactful. Somebody that you operated on when they were three years old and they graduated from college and right. they're going to go into research about robotic surgery. Right. That would be, I think, very nice. Right. No, it's true. Yeah. But it, you're right. It, it is a time suck. So you have to have an assistant manage that property so that you're just getting the good stuff and not right. being sucked into all the nonsense. I'm going to be respectful of your time, but I have one more question for you. And it's, why, have I, why haven't I asked you, do you think it's important for our community to hear? I think we've really covered, well, I think we've covered a lot of nice topics. I think... For the community, I guess, pediatricians to hear. He just, I, I think he, the thing, the biggest thing for me that I saw, and we just talked about it a few minutes ago, is just being available for our colleagues, being available for our patients, and just the importance, I think, of taking the time to educate our patients and taking the time to, to make every patient feel special, give every patient a, a, that experience that they walk out of the office and they feel that you know what, this doctor really cared about me. They took the time, they sat with me, they listened to me. And whether it's something bad and they're going to fix, I feel like I'm in good hands. And whether it's something that I don't really need to worry about, whew, I feel better. I don't have to worry about it. And so that's really how I try to approach each day and day in the life. That's really how I try to approach each interaction. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It was a delightful time with you. It was we'll great. You in person soon. Yeah, thank great. you so Thanks so much for having me. You have to send me a link how to access it. Send it to your email. Thank you very much. And if you have no, a colleague, if you have a colleague in different specialties, you know, put us in touch. Okay. You're a day in the life of a neurologist, a day of a life in a neuro. I'm actually going to get a neurosurgeon. We've already done GI, pulmonary. Cool. Have you done ENT yet? I have a good ENT person. ENT no. we did not do yet. Okay. That's we good. have a really great... She's now been in practice three of the Harvard Talk I don't know if you know her, George. No. I'll, I'll put you guys in touch. Okay. But Herb, thanks for doing this. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Pediatric Lounge. On the show notes, you will find links to our co-host and other important notes as well as a timetable of the topics discussed today. Don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a great review as it helps us greatly. In the meantime, we will see you next week. The Pediatric Lounge. The conversations are not intended as medical advice and the opinions expressed are solely those of the host and the guest.